And when you feel ready, after a couple of minutes, you can slowly open your eyes. Okay, how's everyone doing? Everyone good? Good. Any questions or comments about whatever just happened? So, you know, whatever happens on the outside or on the inside, generally the, the common factor, the common element is that, in the experience, is that uh, some settling down took place. Some settling down, sometimes very dramatically, sometimes more vaguely, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That'll just vary from session to session. Doesn't mean you're doing it right one time and doing it wrong one time. Because doing what? What did we do? What did we do to cause settling to take place? Nothing. Nothing. Thank you very much. Right. We did nothing. Anything we do will be the opposite of settling. Anything we do will be staying active. That's the opposite of settling. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. It's like, you know, trying to flatten out all the waves on the ocean with, the, you know, by batting them with a bat or something, we just wind up churning up the water more. Instead, we just hang out, don't do much in particular, <coughs> and gravity pulls us down into the water, and a foot or two below the surface, we realize, Oh, it's quiet down here all the time. We don't have to do anything about the surface. It doesn't matter there's still some thoughts going on up there. There's still some noise going on up there. That's fine. So the big confusion that people have about meditation is they think it's silencing the mind. It's not silencing the mind. It's discovering the silence of awareness which underlies the mind. Mind is thinking. Mind is the thinking facility, the thinking faculty. And we've got all these faculties, faculty of thinking, faculty of hearing, faculty of seeing, and, and they're, they all function, they're supposed to be doing that stuff. They're supposed to be you know, rising and falling all these waves at the surface. That's all fine. It has to be. So trying to, to flatten all that out is, is not the deal. The deal is discovering that the awareness which underlies all that all the time is silent by nature, is intrinsically silent. And that because we're actually seeking that silence, we're seeking peace all the time in every moment, not just in so-called meditation, but in every moment we're looking for that We're looking for that in every choice that we make, in every, you know, tur should I turn left here or turn right here? <clears throat> should I go to this party or, you know, then you get to the party. Should I talk to this person or I talk to that person? What, you know, and, and in the short term, <clears throat> in the small picture, oh, we're looking for excitement, we're looking for a stimulating conversation. But what are we looking for in that stimulating conversation? Ultimately, some moment of, ah. We're looking for in everything. We're looking for that silence. 
And we get little scraps of it, little bits of it here and there, little bits of that satisfaction, that ah, everything's fine, nothing else, nothing needs to be added to or removed from this moment of experience. We get little, little glimpses of it. And then, you know, our lives become very complicated pursuing those glimpses and trying to get them to hold still for us. It's so much simpler to discover, oh, it's just right here within me all the time. It's the nature of my very own awareness. It's the nature of the, of the space, not trying to find it in all the things within the space. And then, you know, those of you who've been practicing this for a while, you know, you, as you continue to practice, that gets clearer and clearer during the time of meditation. And the really great thing is that more and more that cognition sticks with you and more and more it's recognized during the other 23 and a half hours of the day. That's when it gets really fun. <laughs> and that's when, in a way, it doesn't change anything. You know, red is still red, blue is still blue, ice cream is still ice cream, <laughs> couch is still a couch. It, it changes nothing, but it changes everything because, because more and more you're not coming from a, um, a needy mentality. You know, there's all this kind of, I mean, to my mind, kind of cheesy, you know, like, what do they call it? Prosperity, something prosperity mentality. You know, oh, I'm rich, I'm abundant, I everything is owed to me. You know, whatever it's supposed to be. And you know, I don't know. You're visualizing yourself making a billion dollars or something. <laughs> um, you know, this kind of prosperity stuff. It's a it's a big kind of buzzword in a lot of uh, new agey stuff or something. Um, uh, but to me, the real prosperity, you know, I mean, the whole point of that is to eliminate that, that feeling of incompleteness, that feeling of neediness, right? It's the opposite of that is prosperity. And the real prosperity is discovering that this, this, that which you were seeking in, you know, everything that money can buy is, is, is that, is within you. Now, of course, it's a practical matter. We've got to pay the rent, and you know, it's it's nicer to have a nice car than a fallen apart, you know, jalopy. Uh, but that's okay. No, not a problem. You know, you just um, you know, I'll, I'll have to be monks. You know, some people are. He thought the Buddha was. You know, but but, um, but even the Buddha was very clear. You know, the Buddha didn't say everyone needs to be a monk. He was, because he was a, you know, he was a full-timer specialist in this stuff. But, you know, we have all these records of the, the Buddha, what's called the sutras, the transcripts that have been handed down of the Buddha's teaching when he stopped in this village and talked to these people and stopped in this village and talked to these people. And there's one where a, a guy comes up to him who's a, who's a businessman. And, uh, and, and the Buddha talks to him and turn all about, you know, well, here's what you do to, you know, run your business smoothly, you know? And, he's, and he said, put your wife in charge of the books, <laughs> as a matter of fact. He says, she'll be much better at that than you are. And he said, make sure she's got lots of nice jewelry so she's happy on the job. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it's very clear that, that this awakening to this inner awe, you know, with, with all those words for it, awakening, and it's not in conflict with you know, practical life. Uh, we're still in it, only we're just not trying to all the time extract fulfillment from it. We're, we're approaching it more and more from a place of fulfillment. We're bringing fulfillment to it. And you know what that's like. You know that some people are naturally, even, you know, forget about meditation. Because some people just naturally are more, they're kind of more, you know, you like being around them. It feels, uh, and then other people are just kind of, you know, it's like they suck energy. It's, they suck, they're, they're, they need attention, they need, you know. 
But fortunately, everyone can, can become more like that, that first way. We're not, we're not stuck with what we're born with. So, or what, else? or what our conditioning is. Or what our conditioning is. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah, it's not just what you're, thank you, it's not just what we're born with, but then, then the conditioning, all the... <clears throat> you know, I've been grad, every once in a while, I'm still doing this after all these years, I'll remember something that my mother said when I was little, that was, what? Why did she say that? <laughs> you know? Because you, you don't, you know, when you're little, whatever your parents say is like gospel. And, and then, you know, you don't sit down and systematically, you don't have the whole, and, and, but some of it is really like, you know, can be really just, I mean, in my mother's case, some serious misinformation. <laughs> but, but you don't have a complete catalog of it. You know, and you don't like sit down one day when you're 21 and go through it and go, okay, that one made sense, that one made sense, that one made no sense. So, but just everyone, you know, like there's this thing that my mother said that my brothers and I grew up hearing, which was that never pinch anyone because that can turn into cancer. What? Uh -huh. oh. Exactly. What? Mm. <laughs> That's a good idea probably not to go around pinching people, but, <laughs> but where did she get that? <laughs> probably from her grandmother. She, when she was little, actually, she shared a room with her grandmother, when her grandmother was, was widowed, which was cool because she got a lot of like the old country lore and they, you know, the, you know, I learned like Yiddish songs from her that she learned from her grandmother and so forth. That was fun. But also some crazy stuff. <laughs> it was probably right from the shtetl somewhere in Russia. Yeah. So, but, but yes, the, your point, so we're not, we're not stuck with, you know, more serious than that is, is attitudes that we get. You know, a lot of it is the unspoken stuff, the implied stuff, the, the scripts, the scripts like, um, well, life is a struggle, you know, or the scripts that, um, No one will ever love me, or whatever. Yeah, like no, those no, kind no of, one, you know. no one will ever love you, or, or, or you're, at, you shouldn't, you're asking for too much, mm -hmm. or, you know, all these kinds of, of, of sort of scripts like that, mm -hmm. that are often more implied. So it takes a little more to, to, to dig them out. Um, but this doesn't mean that we necessarily have to go through a whole, um, you know, psychotherapeutic process. To, to become free from this stuff. I mean, certainly that, you know, and I know, you know several of you may have had, you know, counseling or some kind can be very valuable for certain people at certain times. And sometimes to examine that stuff in a conscious way. <coughs> but in a way, this is doing something more profound. Um, it's just the, you know, the effects of that stuff to us, for one thing, they're registered it's not just psychological, it's neurological. You know, the stuff is all registered in the nervous system somewhere. Neurologically, like physically. Mm -hmm. and, and when we settle in meditation, you know, it's like, you know, getting all those neurological imprints, it's like the rubber band being twisted up and then meditation is like putting the rubber band on an empty tabletop and then spontaneously in the, in the relaxed state, the hypometabolic state of meditation, the, the rubber band starts to unravel. And as it unravels, it dances around. So sometimes you experience, you know, maybe the body twitching, or sometimes just, you know, some funny mood comes up, or you feel hot, or you feel cold, or, you know, you feel funny sensations, or you feel like you're floating, or whatever. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, you know, more extreme cases, you feel like laughing, you feel like crying. And that's all that stuff unraveling itself. And it's not, you know, you may, you, it's not that you're necessarily going to remember, oh, this is from the, the, the trauma from the time when I was three years old and the pit bull chased me down the sidewalk, you know. But, but that thing is being unwound. But you, but you don't necessarily have that memory. What you just have is some, you know, twitch. 
Or maybe you feel, very likely, you feel the feeling of fear that you felt when the, when the pit bull chased you down the road, but you don't re replay the little movie of the pit bull. And this is when it's important when, when to, to have the understanding of this process when this stuff comes up, because then you'll you know, ascribe the fear to something close at hand. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid that, you know, when the phone rings, it's going to be, you know, something, you'll ascribe it to something else. So, you know, and that's more extreme kind of cases that um, actually happen more when you go on retreat than meditate for hours a day. But it's just good to know that when this stuff comes up, it's just fine. It's just stuff getting, something good is happening, got to process it. And some of the stuff will, that doesn't go away. You know, the conditioning, like a lot of our conditioning is cultural, you know, grew up eating certain kinds of food, you may really like those kinds of food, you know, we're not all going to become, start eating like, like, in, you know, Indians because we're practicing meditation or something. Even Tibetans don't eat like Indians. Mm -hmm. Tibetans eat yak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's other than that cult. But, but what happens is more and more, the, the cultural stuff is still there and some of the personal, individual conditioning is still there, maybe till the day you die. But more and more it becomes like, like it's made out of, it's not made out so much out of rock, it's like it's made out of glass. The only way I can describe it. More and more, we see through it. <clears throat> like the Dalai Lama <clears throat> is afraid of worms, <laughs> right? Some conditioning, something from yeah. from his youth. He was afraid of worms. Wow. You know, he's pro. Um, my guess, he's a pretty enlightened guy, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean his that his fear of worms went away. But what it means is, he laughs about it. <laughs> it's funny. But it's still there. But he laughs about it, right? He, it's just, it's not gripping. It may still be there, but it's not gripping. The, the grip of the stuff becomes less and less. It just becomes like, you know, kind of old friends. Oh yeah, that, okay. What else? What else is Have on you heard a comedian, Carl Sees? Carl? Carl Sees. C? Sees. C E S E no. something like that. No. Well, I happen to listen to him. Um, he's yeah, pretty so good. Speak up a little for the YouTube. He's class. a pretty good comedian, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. talks about um, self-awareness mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. humor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never heard somebody really go into humor, mm -hmm. and he's all over the place. And mm. and one thing that struck me is when he said, you know. Meditation is so much like going to the toilet. Right. <laughs> and he got everybody's attention. Yeah, right. <laughs> of course. Only when it's really well well done. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. Because when it's really right, you just sit and do nothing. <laughs> and it works. Mm -hmm. It's like he was so good. Yes. And he says, and you let go. Of everything and that then is you, not and you. And then you experience oh, emptiness. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've been saying that for years. Yafa keeps telling me not to say this, but you know, <laughs> people say, well, what is it like, you know, as you get, grow more and more through meditation? And, and you know, so I'll say it tonight. You know when you've had just a really good poop? <laughs> you know, like the poop of your dreams, and you just feel so cleared out, and just like the air becomes clear and sparkly, and just kind of like that. <laughs> I think but, that's a guy thing. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Girls don't poop. No, no, that's right. They poop roses. <laughs> I have to go back to 1992 to remember that. <laughs> Um, actually, another comedian who's a friend of mine, Adam Ferrara, uh, talks somewhat about this stuff more and more. Uh, he's, 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 it's becoming part of the, the act. Uh, he has a podcast, if you want to check out the Adam Ferrara podcast. Um, um, 
He's a meditator. Yeah, he's yeah. He he free, first reached out to me a few years ago because he was he wrote me a nice email saying he's been reading my books and you know he's on the road a lot and he uses my audio books and if I'm ever in Santa Monica let's get together and you know, <laughs> but, so turns out he lives here in Santa Monica oh, that's and, right. that's funny. and uh, um, his podcast is really interesting because because like the beginning and the end. Is is usually kind of raunchy, guyish humor. I was gonna say that. I thought that was that was his thing. I'm sorry. I said I thought that was his thing. Well, kind of, yeah. But also, like in the podcast, then in the middle, he does an interview. He calls it the ADHD interview because because he's 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 got attention problems. Uh, but he interviews you know really interesting people and gets into some pretty deep life stuff. He, we, we're actually I'm, I'm going to appear on his podcast sometime soon. Yeah. Um, but you know, humor, even if it never explicitly mentions meditation or awareness or awakening or emptiness or anything, um, you know, the poet Gregory Corso uh, once said, um, Humor is the divine butcher. Right? Humor is the divine butcher. You know, it cuts stuff down to size. You know, what is humor about? <clears throat> you know, what are the main the main topics of humor? It's the stuff that we worry about, right? It's about politics and relationships and money and sex and you know all the stuff that people are stressed about, right? And then so it brings up the topic. That evokes our queasiest worries, mm -hmm. and then through some funny jujitsu, you know, suddenly there's a flip, there's a there's a reversal, there's an unexpected something, there's some pun, there's some slip on a, on a banana peel, something that triggers this weird respiratory reflex that somehow gives us a massage, internal massage of the viscera. And that stimulates a bunch of endorphins, and and in the light of that, we're still, you know, thinking about that topic. But now, in the light of that sudden change in our neurophysiology, it cuts it down to size. It's not so serious looking. Hmm. It's not so serious looking. I mean, I, I think this is why humor is so important. And can you see how how exactly parallel that is to what we do in meditation? The same situations are there, the same problems are there, but we, you know, in this case, we more just gently melt into the intrinsic openness, emptiness, boundlessness of our own awareness, and then when we come back to the same stuff, you know, where before maybe it dominated our whole, you know, scope of our attention, now our attention is widened and it's, it's cut down to size. And also in meditation, there's more gently, there's the release of endorphins and you know all that kind of physiological change. A lot of comedians are meditators. A lot of comedians are meditators. Yeah, Jerry Seinfeld's been doing. He's been meditating since like forever, since near the beginning of his career. Howard Stern. Howard Stern. Howard Stern. Howard Stern. Yeah. Russell Brand. Russell Brand. Yep. Yep. Good. What else? No question. Yes. If we're not supposed to be quieting the thoughts, mm -hmm. how do you keep them from distracting you from? From peace? okay, okay. Now, it, now look where you're going with that sentence. If we're not quieting the thoughts, how do, are you supposed to keep them from distracting from from what? From peace. peace. Okay, so <clears throat> so think of let's say you're sitting at a sidewalk cafe with uh, with 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 your friend here, <laughs> and you know you're enjoying some nice drinks, you're enjoying your cool mint juleps on a warm afternoon. Um, traffic's going by. 
Maybe conversations are happening at the other tables. Occasionally an airplane goes by. Occasionally a car with a loud radio goes by. You're sitting there having a nice, peaceful conversation. Right? It's very tranquil. It's very easygoing. All the presence of all that stuff doesn't prevent you from just essentially resting in the pleasant peacefulness of that conversation. Occasionally, let's say there's a really loud radio and maybe your attention goes to that, maybe you get kind of annoyed by it, but then it passes and you can come back to this. Okay? You've done this many times. Okay? Essentially what you're doing is you're ignoring that other stuff. Now, ignoring it doesn't mean you're going, okay, I gotta ignore this. I gotta you know, there it doesn't mean blocking it out. It's it's it, there's there's no doing involved. Now, if on the other hand, you you sudden you decide, how can I sit here and enjoy my mint julep and enjoy my peaceful conversation with my friend when all that traffic's there? I gotta run out there and make all the traffic stop, hold up the big stop sign. Right? I got have these people are so rude having a conversation that they, you know you try to shut that. If you if you decide that it's a problem, then you create a problem. <laughs> right? So can I respond to that? I'm sorry? Can I respond to that real fast? Yeah, please. Um because I feel like I, and that is something that I've worked on, like not letting the external things mm -hmm. bug me, because you'll never be able to control everybody around you and Mm -hmm. And I'm just talking in life, not in this room. It's just ah. the noises they make mm -hmm. or rude things that they say, right. whatever. And so mm -hmm. I've been working on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel good about that, like the external things. Right. But the analogy of being in the cafe, you have another person to, to focus mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. to distract you from that stuff. Or you can, I guess, I, I get shutting out the external is when it's inside. Yep. Like, how do you shut it? And I know you're saying the point is to not shut it out. Right. But it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts yeah. are so annoying. It was all these stupid things from today that I, right. that I had to think about. I don't want to think about them anymore. Right, right. <laughs> so the first thing to know is that every single person in this room and a whole bunch of others have gone through exactly that question that you're looking at now and have said, this can't possibly be okay, mm -hmm. right? It can't possibly be okay that that stuff is there. I have to do something about it. It just seems, it can seem impossible that it's okay for the stuff to be there, okay? Um, but also, all the people in this room have been practicing for a while and, the, you know, literally thousands of others that I've worked with, that I've taught, and millions of others that I've never, ever, never met, have all made that same discovery. Okay, you just, you just leave it alone. <laughs> you leave it alone. When you just leave the stuff alone, naturally this settling down takes place. There is a tendency for the amount of internal stuff to become less. But that's not a goal. We're not looking for, uh, okay, now I had a good meditation because there was only, you know, 97 thoughts instead of 98 last time. You know, we, we, that, that's not, that's not a, a, a useful uh, approach. Uh, but just overall, in general, as we go along, there's a tendency for, for, for the mind to become quieter. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that as we just <clears throat> rest, we just notice, okay, stuff is coming and going. The thoughts come and go. The sounds come and go. The feelings come and go, and the feelings include the feeling that uh, these thoughts are really annoying. Mm -hmm. That also, that thought, the thought, oh, thoughts are annoying, you know what that is? That's a thought. <laughs> right. That's just a thought. 
Um, the, in Buddhist philosophy, they have a very useful perspective on this, which is they consider thought to be the sixth sense. And I don't mean sixth sense like, you know, clairvoyance or ESP or something. Just so, right, okay, we have seeing. Each sense has a certain kind of sense object. So seeing, we see colors and shapes. Hearing, we hear sounds, pitch and timbre and, and all of that volume. Uh, 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 taste, we taste flavors. Smell, we smell aromas. Uh, feeling, we feel you know, textures and temperatures and so forth. Thought, we experience thoughts. Just cons we consider thoughts to be an object of the senses. It is just, you know, this thought is just like a color, or this thought is like a flavor or something. We just consider them to be like textures or aromas or something. Just more stuff that comes and goes. As for the content of it, that this thought is saying, oh, blah, 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 this thing about, you know, what happened at work today. Or this one that's going blah, 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 I should not be having this thought about work. <laughs> or this one going blah, 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 I shouldn't be having this thought that I shouldn't be having the thought. We, right? we can go on forever like that. Or we can just say, fuck it. That's the, that's the, the best instruction, really. Just screw it all and just say, consider it all like it's in a foreign language. It's all in Romanian. Do you speak Romanian? No. Okay, good. It's all in Romanian. And just it's all just some blah 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 and just and and it may seem oh it's impossible to do that but you sit and do that like this a few times and um, you know on my website I've got a couple of places where the guided meditation there's a there's a link right on the home page meditate now where I you know guide pretty much the way that we did here and do that a few times it's really good to sit down ideally every day for 10 15 minutes and a few times, and you realize, oh yeah, it really is possible to just be, just hang out, let the stuff come and go, and, and realize there's nothing I have to do about it. And more and more it becomes clear that the, the settling into the intrinsic silence of awareness, no matter what's going on with the mind, the intrinsic silence of the awareness that underlies it gets clearer and clearer. And the ocean is so big, it's so deep, and the waves are so shallow. When all we know is the waves, they seem huge, right? They like dwarf our life. But more and more, our, our, our recognition of this oceanic awareness that underlies them, it just, that just becomes like, is, is this making sense right here? What else do you need to hear from me to be able to go home and do this? Anything? Let me mention one thing. You, usually, we want to start with some kind of what I call on-ramp. Because we're going running around doing a lot of things, now we're going to sit and essentially do nothing, just rest in awareness. It's usually useful to have one thing that we do for a few minutes. So, um, like you say, when you're sitting, talking with a friend, you can, you're focusing on them. So it's good to have something that we focus on for a few minutes as the kind of transition in. So you could pay attention to your breath, just breathing in maybe a little more fully and deeply and slowly than usual, really paying attention to breathing in. And then, you know, there's that moment of where the breath is suspended, where you're not holding the breath, just suspended, and then slowly out. So you can do that a few times. That's usually the easiest, simplest, most convenient. Or just rest your gaze on a spot or, you know, your hands or a flower or something. And, oh yeah, just rest in there and then close the eyes. Because like, sometimes if my mind is just going blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, Louder, please. For the mic. Um, if my mind is really racing and I then go, oh, I've been thinking about that problem for the past 20 minutes or whatever mm -hmm. it feels right. like it's been um i mean i besides the on-ramp i mean sometimes mm -hmm. in the middle of meditation i will find mm. some helpfulness to do some practice to just get kind of yeah so it's it's not shutting off the thoughts or trying to keep them at bay as much as just like oh wait 
this is my moment to sit. <laughs> I don't want to be just going rah, 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 so I'll no, yeah, I you can have the feeling of like reset. Yeah. 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 The feeling of, and, and the simplest way, I find, the simplest way to reset is just take a deep breath. Ah, oh, you know, you can have the idea um, of, of taking a deep breath and then breathing out 360 degrees. Um, you may even want to use your, your, your hands to kind of as the cue. So it's not just breathing out through your mouth, you know, it's like as if you were breathing out through all your pores, 360 degrees and in, in all, you know, infinitely far in all directions. <sighs> just kind of reset, clear the space like that, and then rest in that open 360 degree space. And that, that, in, in, in that kind of situation you're describing, you might do that a number of times, and that's and that's fine. Then just rest in that space, and then and then as you continue to practice, you'll you'll find that's less and less necessary. It's kind of like training wheels. Good. What else? But it's training wheels even after doing this for twenty years. I do that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah, and even after doing this stuff for 20 years, 40 years, you know, 50 years, yeah, sometimes, depending on what's going on, you use more of that when you feel that, that things are just really, you just feel lost in, in the turmoil, emotional turmoil, or lost in mental turmoil. Yeah, it's fine that you have a little something that you do for a little while. Um, but in general, the direction is that, that the, the, the training wheels become less less necessary. What else? I've been practicing with uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. Hello, nothing. <laughs> this is nothing. Hello, nothing. Yeah. Are you there, nothing? It really didn't help. Mm-hmm. And it was something it, that it did nothing for you. Yeah, it did nothing in the sense that it was a not a nice feeling about mm -hmm. it. And so inside of me, something came like like a voice. Mm -hmm. like, give you, it didn't say, this, but give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. You are the light. Anybody <laughs> heard? You are the light. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah. So it's like, even if it, I know it's something, it's like, okay, my body relaxed. Mm -hmm. and, and then I. I connected to what uh, the Buddha and the non-dual thinking always says. It, it's not nothing. It is no thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I went, okay, no thing. Hello, mm -hmm. no thing. This is no. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that just that little tweak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even space, and I know space. We, you know, it's like a noun. We name it something. Mm -hmm. But, like, I need to relax the body first. I need to feel comfortable mm -hmm. as I go in there. Yeah. And that's, that's my little on-ramp, I think, that it's no thing, not nothing. Yeah, yeah. All's fair in love and war and, <laughs> and, and dharma, right? You know, whatever works, whatever floats your boat, that's the thing you use. And you know, as as you become, you know, you're an ex experience. You're a, you're a mature practitioner, and 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 uh, you know, you can have a sense of what works for you. Ultimately, it all gets thrown away. You know, okay, nothing. See, anything and anything we use that's words that has any kind of conceptual aspect to it. It's going to be a little bit relative, a little different, um, different resonance for different people. You know, for me, nothing is not something. Nothing is no thing. Nothing is not a thing. It's not, for some people, they hear nothing, and it's like, oh, some, some it's negative, it's, oh, it's something awful, but see, they're making it something. It connects to sadness. Like yeah, that, that, yeah, that there's something nice. Right. I, I wasn't there, and then with this nothing, it's like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I don't happen to have that 
association with that word. Uh, to, you know, we, we were recently at this wonderful uh, one-man show. We talked about Bill Irwin's one-man show on, on Beckett, on the works of Samuel Beckett. And, and he, they had quotes in the lobby from Beckett's work. And my favorite one, I took a photo of it, nothing is more important than nothing. <laughs> um, uh, so if that word rings a bell for you, then great. Go with that ringing of the bell and then settle down and all the bells go away anyway. And all the words that simulated them go away anyway. If that word is a stumbling block for you, then don't, don't, don't use it. Don't use it. Um, you know, occasionally to mix things up, I'll, you know, I'll throw in, throw out something. You know, for some people the word light, for some people the word God is going to be the highest, most inspiring word. For some people, the word God is absolutely a stumbling block. Just brings up all kinds of, you know, maybe bad associations from from their religious upbringing or whatever. They're they're, they're now intellectually wrestling with, oh, is God a big man in the sky? Blah blah right. blah. So so in that case, you don't don't use that word. Ultimately. Any of this stuff, you know, what the methods do, like we say, okay, whatever works for you. Great, use that. What do we mean by it works for you? What works for you is it facilitates settling down into the natural space-like openness of your own awareness, which has no words, which has no description, no gender, no religion, no nationality, no nothing. <laughs> no nothing. No nothing, but it's not depressing, it's a, because that would be something. That's just our concept, oh, that must be depressing, that's a concept, that's a thought. No, it's free of that thought, it's free. It's like, it's like after a great poop. <laughs> <laughs> the poop of the mind. Um, Sparkling emptiness, luminous emptiness. So it is a phrase that the Buddhist philosophy uses sometimes. Luminous emptiness, empty luminosity. As, as your own cognition of it gets more and more clear, you don't need me or anyone else to tell you about it. It's just, oh yeah, that, 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 this, this. And more and more you're just walking around in this. And more and more, it's that which makes life okay. And there's still challenges to be met. There's still stuff to deal with. But it's more and more it's happening from that place of sparkling clarity, sparkling lumina, luminous emptiness, okayness. And you know, that's why you're nodding your head. You know what happens. You've been doing the practice. You've been getting the result. Yeah. I was say a few weeks ago, I got thrown by a kind of life-changing loop, mm -hmm. and I had so much going on because I was running classes and blah, 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 and I realized I had quit yoga and I quit meditation, mm -hmm. and everything kind of came crashing down, and then my mind, I went, oh, just go back to what you know, mm -hmm. and everything is fine now, no matter what happens. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, oh, you know. And mm. it was because I just, you kind of get mm. sidetracked. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know, <laughs> in a crisis, sometimes I, you don't think logically. And mm -hmm. so um, it's, it really makes such a difference. Yeah. Every morning, if I start out right, nothing can happen that really messes me up. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is hard. It took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I know a little bit about your life, and you, you, you deal with some, some <laughs> big stuff, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but I just feel lucky now, and I always try to compare it to, yeah. look what's going on here with the weather and people losing mm, everything, yeah. Yeah. and then I'm, I'm going, wow, the less things I have, the less I have to lose. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. kind of interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a great story, which I, I tell the story in, in, in my last book, In Fearless, um, about 
uh, Masahide, who was a, uh, a, a, a in the, I think the 16th century, he was a Japanese samurai poet, mm -hmm. and he to become quite a wealthy man, and he had all his his wealth was all in this barn, and his barn burnt down, he lost it all. Mm. And, um, and in response, he wrote a haiku. Mm -hmm. And the haiku said, barns burnt down, now I can see the moon. The moon. Yeah. Oh, love it. Right, right. And of course, the moon there symbolizes the essential luminosity of, of awareness itself, of life itself, of being itself. I send that card out all the time. Yeah. I'm hoping people get it. Hoping people get it, yeah. 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 Because it is in times of loss, in times of loss, and, uh, um, you know, and these things happen, and they happen to every one of us. It's the way it goes. We all lose stuff. Uh, we all lose people. And, um, and it's not... You know, we don't want to be Pollyannish about it. Oh, I'm not going to feel any grief. Of course you're going to feel grief. It, you know, awakening doesn't mean you don't have emotions. But it means there is this more profound thing along with it. Um, which it just, in time of loss, is also a time of opportunity to really view that, that moon. To view that, that, that open sky. And then, you know, if you're lucky, if you play your cards right, then, you know, when things get more on an even keel, you still maintain some of that vision. You don't have to wait. For, you don't have to keep getting stuff pulled away from you to, to see that. But, but again, just doing the practice, sitting down every day, doing meditation for some 10, 15 minutes uh, helps to, to stabilize that vision. But it's very interesting what, what you described, yeah. you know, where you just, you know, you got so busy or you got so caught up in stuff that you drifted away from your practice. In a way, it's great. It's a great experience because it gives you the A-B test. It gives you, it gives you, gives you the chance to, oh, this is what life is like without the meditation. And, oh, is this why things are being experienced this way? And come back, back. Oh, yeah, uh, that's much better. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to do that, by the way, some of you have heard me recommend it. I say, you go into a New Jersey, I used to say a diner. We don't really have diners here, but I'd say, do they? Where? Mel's Diner? Mel's Diner, right. Yeah. So go to Mel's Diner. And, and, and what I tell people, you go to the diner by yourself, order a, a, a piece of pie and a cup of coffee, and eavesdrop on the conversations in the other booths. And then you, 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 especially when you've been practicing for a while, and you go, when you ha you're having one of those weeks or months where you go, God, is this stuff working? And you go and eavesdrop on the conversation in, in the other booths, and you see how, I, I hope this doesn't sound too arrogant, but listen to how, you, what other people are saying, how they live their lives, and then you go, oh yeah, this is working. <laughs> okay, so we'll do this again in two weeks. Um, and um, may all beings swiftly realize the intrinsic, joyous, sparkling, empty, boundless okayness of their own awareness. And thus, may harmony and peace spontaneously arise in this world and all possible worlds. <clears throat> and the traditional Sanskrit language for that which Loka Samasta Sukin